Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're talking about walleye. Everybody's here for walleye. Why are they here for walleye? Because walleye taste. Awesome. But we don't kill. They oh, yes. Way to go, fellas. There's something I can stress just to start out before we get into this with these walleyes. You're living in one of the greatest walleye areas in the country, even in Canada. More big fish coming out of that Columbia River system, potholes, Moses system, than anywhere around. More consistent big fish. And what's happening is that people are going out and they're killing these fish, these big fish. And there was just a recent ride up in, in Fisherman where they were talking about this. And they're putting the knife, as they called it, to these fish over 10 pounds. And every one that gets caught comes in and gets whacked. Okay? It's not what we want to do. And the belief system is, well, there's so many of them out there, they're plentiful, we can just pull them out. If you want to eat a walleye, the 16, 18, 20 inch is the best one to eat. Odds are it's probably not mature yet. Take it home, eat it. Take your limit. Let the big ones go. If we continue to let the big fish go, we're going to have world record fish coming right out of our back door. All the way through that Columbia system. You know, there was a 19.8 caught last year down by Tri-Cities. We go into the same spot and do our night walleye stuff every year. Chad got a 16 and a half. That as far as all the research has showed, Crestliner's done. Some of the other people in the walleye industry have done is the largest walleye ever caught on film. And it's, yes, knowing what to do and where to go, but it's living here. So let's make sure when you get these big fish, turn them back, because you will get them. I had a guy email me about the drop shot stuff. I told him where to go. I said, hey, if you get a big one, man, take a picture. Let it go. About a week later, he emails me from his driveway with a 15-8, dead. I don't want to see that. It's your license, do as you want, but think about, when I think about fishing, I think about my little daughter. What is she going to have down the road? Okay, those things take a while to get that big. I want her to be able to enjoy it, and I want it to go down the road. So don't just catch them, throw them in the cooler, and drive them around to your buddies. Measure them, get pictures, get a replica. That's all you need. Small ones are good to eat. So one thing when I do the seminars and stuff, I had a walleye center at Sportsman's Warehouse, went in, did a night walleye thing. These two brothers, they were so dialed in on what was going on, they were listening to everything I had to say. Told them where to go. Eight months later, I ran into the warehouse. They came over, they got 11, 11 and 3 quarter. Did exactly what we told them to do, biggest wall they'd ever caught. And they turned it back. That's what we want to hear. Okay? That's what we want to hear. So just keep that in mind. Anything, guys, whether it's a big bass or whatever, turn that thing back. That's the gene pool, man. That's what keeps it going. So I'll get out my soapbox now. <laughs> All right. First thing we want to do is we want to talk about understanding the walleye. If you understand the walleye, you're going to understand how to fish for the walleye. That's the main thing. They're a little peculiar. they got the weird eyes. Why is that? What do they see? They see different. Okay. When you understand them, you're going to understand how to fish for them. There's a million different techniques. As you can see, we've got stuff sprawled all over. And we're going to cover that in the second half. But once again, the first half, we'll talk about the fish, understanding where he lives, why he lives there. The walleye is a perch family. There's two subdivisions. You got the walleye, you got the sauger, and you got the saw guy. We're dealing with straight walleye. If you're going to catch sauger, you have to go head east, Montana. A saw guy is a combination between, it's a hybrid between a walleye and a sauger. Happens naturally, also happens in the lab. Just happens when they crossbreed, just like a tiger muskie. Our tiger muskie out here, they're made in the lab. Minnesota, it happens. Sometimes it's rare, but it does. It's just a hybrid. So we're dealing with straight walleye. Biggest walleye I ever caught was caught in 1960 on August 2nd. It was 25 pounds. Old Hickory Lake, Tennessee. It was caught using 75 pound test line, a six odd hook, and a big old minnow. Fishing for catfish. They eat big things. The significance of that is that record is going to be broken at some point in time in your backyard. I didn't tell you the record bass because you're not going to break it over at Newman. Okay? The walleye, it can be broken here. It can't happen. Now when you look at the walleye, you got to understand the biology of his eye. Why does that eye look that way? When you're out night fishing, you'll see him a foot down with the bow light on and they'll be glowing. It's a reflective layer 
or pigment layer within the eye, and I gotta look at the name of this thing and I'll probably mess it up. It's called the Tapetum Lucidum. What does that mean? That's a biology thing, it's not important to you. But what that does is it allows more light to get into the retina, which increases their ability to see. Walleye are what kind of feeders? When do they feed most? When do you see the big ones? Nighttime. Low light, very sensitive eye. That's going to play into how we fish them when we go through this. When you go in and look at a jig setup, whether it be at the Swartzons, Cabells, wherever it's at, and you see the big you know, Northland displays or whatever, you always notice the jigs are usually some form of green or some form of red, be it an orange, be it fluorescent orange, be it chartreuse. You ever notice that? Remember how we talked about in the water column how colors penetrate down through, blue goes the farthest? Well, guess what? Well, I can't see blue. So the thought's got to change. Reason being is that you and I have two types of cells in the eyes. We have red-green cells, yellow-blue cells. People that are colorblind are typically missing the yellow-blue cells. Walleye are the same way. Bass and pike can see many different hues. They have both. Walleye has the red and green. So that's why most of your lures that you see are always orange, red, green, the jig heads, because that's what they see best. Now, if you've got cloudy or muddy water, what color is most visible? Fluorescence in the greens, right? Because red starts to disappear at 30 feet. So when you got the, the muddy water, those chartreuse colors in the greens is what's going to pop for you. And we'll talk about that when we get to the baits. But you have to understand that part in order to first understand how to catch the fish. Why does he feed at night? Well, he can see, and it doesn't have to be night, it can be low light hours. But he sees well in low light. His prey does not. Gives him an advantage for feeding. Very important. The lateral line, does everybody know what the lateral line is? Every fish has one. Runs down the side of the body, it usually looks like a, like a piece of cord or line running down through it. Starts up high and runs down through the tail. Those are nerve endings. What they feel is vibration. Their ability to sense vibration is very sensitive. If a school of bait fish goes by, they can feel one fish not swimming quite right and hone in on it. Their hearing is very keen. When you're fishing clear water like we have around here and you've got walleyes up shallow, you better be casting to them instead of trolling over them. You throw an anchor in, kadoosh, forget it. They get spooky real easy with noise, banging on the floor of the boat. Very spooky to that. Bass and stuff, don't notice it as much, but the walleyes you do. Sense of smell. Sense of smell in a walleye is not as keen as you may think. I gotta have natural bait. I'm gonna ask you guys, you watch the show, how many times have you seen me put a leech or a worm on a hook on a show and catch big walleyes? Never seen it, have you? Reason being, and that's not to say that they don't work, because they do. But what you have to understand, you know the big blade bait craze right now? You guys rip a blade bait, they shake like crazy. Well, that's sensing the vibration to the lateral line, which is bringing them in. Now, we do use scents on our baits, because what happens, once they hone in on it, then they can get in there and smell it, taste it, and do that. But it's not their primary sense. If that was the case when you were fishing in muddy water, you would have live bait on and it would outfish an artificial. But in dirty water, an artificial always outfishes a live. Why is that? An artificial is making more vibration. If it's got rattles, it's making more noise. An example of this, we went down last year, fishing down at one of our spots by Blue Creek. Pulled up there and all these guys, hey, that's Seth, they knew. They were kind of whispering. We pull on, we get it all the time. I don't care if you see me out there, come over and say hi. If you need help, whatever. We pulled in. Threw out was Mick and I. We got one fish about 20 inches and another one about 16. Bam, bam. And they just went. Whoa. Well, everybody was dragging around jigs. And last year the water was extremely muddy. Extremely muddy. And it was tough fishing. Well, you got to use the vibrating baits. You got to use bright jigs. You got to use pulse worms, which we'll talk about. Because you got to push that sense. You got to push that lateral line. You got to move that water to get them to find it. Look at a spinner. Spinner makes vibration. They find that. The added bonus is when they get behind it and they smell what's on it. So not as keen as you would think, the smell. Not as important. 
The lifespan, 15 years. They've lived up to 26 years, typically 15 years. As you move south, they live less. You get down to the southernmost extremities, maybe 10 years. But they grow faster because they have a longer feeding season. Our fish up here don't have as long of a feeding season, but they've got more of the right food. More of the right food. That's why we're getting the sizes that we're getting. We're going to talk about that when we get into a little later. Sexual maturity, males two to four years, females three to five. That's why I say keep them smaller ones, those ones that aren't mature yet. Preferred water temperature, 65 degrees. Now, obviously, it's not 65 out there, but you can still make them bite. But if you look at it in terms of looking across the board from, say, a trout to a bass in a pike, or excuse me, in a walleye, he's middle of the road. Bass like it 70, maybe 75, largemouth. Trout like it, you know, 50, 55. They're kind of in the middle of the road. That's why they spawn earlier, spawn when it's colder. The key to that is when we get later down the road, and we remember the thermocline? We're going to talk about how that fits in. Remember that. Keep the water temperature 65. That's where they like it. Now what we're going to do, we're going to cover our movements. This is going to take us through here a little bit. you got to understand where to go. 90% of the water holds 10% of the fish. We've got to believe in our electronics. We're going to go home. We're going to set them up the next time we go out. And we're going to locate the fish instead of just going out there shooting in the dark. Now, a lot of times around here this time of year, getting into February, you can go out and just look for the boats. Obviously, a guy caught one there. There's going to be a bunch of people around. But what you have to think about, right now they're wanting to be in 40 to 60 feet of water, maybe 70, 80 feet of water. They want to be deeper. Why do they want to be deeper? What happens? Water. 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 Boom. Water's warmer right now. The warmer water is down low. There's been studies done that say walleye live in 30 feet of water or less most of their life. That can be true, but what kind of lake is it? Well, we got big basin reservoirs here. Thermoclines build up. Fish go down. They fish be deeper. When you read, you got to take it and adapt it, remember, to what your area is telling you. So right now, 40 to 60 feet. I typically don't like to fish that deep because I don't want to bring them up and blow them up if I catch a big fish. You know, I don't want to pull them through two or three atmospheres and have them But this time of year, if you're going to catch them, you've got to be down there. Where do they want to be at? Well, going back, I keep picking, I like red. I just, this, that pen don't work no more. <laughs> going back to contours, reading and understand your contours. There's a lot of contour maps of Roosevelt, Potholes, Moses, our lakes around here. The guys in the Midwest got it made because there's all kinds of maps of the lakes. They're doing a lot more of that back there, and it's starting to happen out here. But you can find maps. Northwest Maps, downtown Spokane. You can get an actual nautical map of Roosevelt. We use it all the time. You can get the fishing map company maps that you see at the sporting goods counters. Those are great. They tell you the hot spots. Go fish here. Not all the hot spots are on there. Okay, it's important to know what you're looking for. Right now, guys, what they want to do, we're going to come into our old friend here. If we've got, we're looking down on top of it, and we're looking at our contours, and the river's just kind of doing, we'll just kind of call this a flat or whatever. And let me just put some contours in. Oops, that wasn't very smart. If you can under, understand your underwater structure, guys, through maps and paying attention to your background. It's going to make you such a better fisherman. You got this kind of thing going like this. When the lines are further apart, what's that mean? Okay, less of a slope, right? Okay. So this kind of give you just a real quick rough one. What they want to do, they want to be where there's a steep drop. Now remember how we talked about shelves when we went through our words at the beginning? Talked about shelves. A lot of shelves in the Columbia system, especially in Roosevelt, where the water's gone down, eroded it, and you get these these shelves, bang. 
What these fish will do, once again, if you look, what have we just made here? Made a triangle, right? What they want to do is they're going to live out in here where it's a steep break, where the contour lines are tight. But they want to be adjacent to a place where they can go eat. That's what the adjacent means. Right here. This is a, this is a feeding flat up in here. What will happen when you go down in the morning, you're going to start out fishing deep, 40 to 60 feet. If you get a nice little chop coming out of the south, the sun's out, and it's pushing the warm water this way, what are they going to do? They want to get warm, right? They're going to pull up. They're not going to pull up here. They're going to pull up out here. Just off the edge, because if things get bad, they want to do what? Go back to their safe haven. So you want to be on a steep break, 40 to 60 feet, with the potential to come up and eat. You don't want to be on a straight rock bluff. There's nothing there for them. They want to relate to that break right there. It's not uncommon, guys, in the middle of winter, if the wind's blowing a nice little chop, not crazy, but a nice little chop, it's not uncommon to cast your bait right up on the bank and drag it into a foot or two of water and there's a fish. Because they're taking all the warm air, even if it's a degree or two. Anything that's getting pushed up in here and mixing, it's going to drive them up in there because they want the warmth. That warmth draws in the bait fish because they want the warmth too. Let's go in there and eat. Steep breaks.